if there is a paragraph of Scripture that's more debated than Revelation 20, the beginning, it's probably Daniel 9, 24 through 27. You know, Matthew 24, too, but that's a huge passage. This is just a few verses, and it's a lot of debate. But what I am determined in my heart to do, and you'll have to let me know how we, if we pull this off or not, is to, what's that saying, don't miss the forest for the trees? Which means don't get so caught up in the minutia and the details that you miss the main point. So whatever... Whatever I'm wrong about tonight, whatever we don't understand or whatever detail we don't get to, I want to get the overall significance, the overall covenantal significance of the 70 weeks prophecy. I'm calling this study, just as a title, God's faithfulness to his promise underneath all of the issues and the prophecies. The issue is God's faithfulness. God has promised to restore his people, and he will be faithful to his promise, and he will restore his people, and that's the forest I don't want to miss. So Daniel 9, 24 through 27, let me give you a little bit of a road map to, to how I'm going to approach this paragraph. First, we're going to read it. Let's read it. Seventy weeks are decreed, which simply means God has determined this. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people. It's referring to Israel and your holy city, which is referring to Jerusalem, to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, Literally, the Hebrew is to seal up sin, to seal up sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in or to usher in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up or to seal both vision and profit. To seal up both vision and profit, the prophets who receive those visions, and to anoint a most holy place, which is very intriguing. And we won't get into the details of that this week. But in the Old Testament, places were not anointed. People were anointed. Hopefully that whets your appetite for a few weeks when we get there. Verse 25. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build up Jerusalem... To the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for sixty-two weeks it shall be built again with squares and moats, but in a troubled time. And after sixty-two weeks, I'll map it out, there's seven, and then there's a sixty-two. And then after the sixty-two weeks, the anointed one shall be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city, and the sanctuary. Wait a minute, I thought this was a prophecy about the restoration of the city and the restoration of the sanctuary by implication. But destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, that means total, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Desolation, in a general sense, is one of the effects of when God brings judgment against his people and he exiles them out or he basically wipes them out. And things are left desolate. Your house is left to you desolate. So desolation is part of covenantal judgment against the people of God. Now, one of the things that makes this such a hotly debated, but just so widely debated paragraph is there's so many details. 
you have, uh, you have a few lists, you have lots of things that are happening, you have dates, you have um, main characters, you have sim- symbols in here. So just the, it's a short paragraph, but there's so many things that are said. That's one of the reasons there's so many different views on it. Let me map out the way I want to address this. First of all, we're going to take at least two weeks, maybe three. Now today I want to Tell me if I'm going too fast as we start getting into this, but I want to go slow. I want to look at the overarching point, which will be the bulk of our time tonight. But first, I want to look at the context. We're going to review the context because we have not been in Daniel in three or four weeks. So let's remember the context. I'm not going to read verses 1 through 19, but if you'd like to skim through them, you probably will remember what verses 1 through 19 were. This was Daniel praying for restoration. He was confessing. He was, he was acting as a mediator for the people of Israel. He was asking for mercy. He was confessing sin. He was asking for and praying for and crying for restoration, admitting that they are the ones who broke the covenant. Israel needs forgiveness for their covenantal rebellion against God. We will look at verses 4 And five, part of Daniel's prayer, he says, I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules, which they were required to keep under the covenant. So there's a contrast between God and Israel. God is, he keeps covenant right in the middle of verse four. God keeps covenant. What has Israel done? Has Israel kept the covenant? They break. They break the covenant. They're covenant breakers. So this is the issue here. They're covenant uh, rebellion, but still God is faithful to the covenant. Also, you can look at verses 11 through 13 he has confirmed his words which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity for under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what has been done against jerusalem as it is written in the law of moses which is the law of the covenant this is the mosaic covenant the mosaic law that they're accountable for As is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Daniel does not hold it against God that God brought calamity against Israel. Daniel sees that as one more instance of God's covenant faithfulness, that he brought the calamity that he uh, threatened upon Israel breaking covenant with him and God sent them prophets sent the leaders prophets and they did not receive the prophets they did not repent they hated the prophets and rejected the prophets and just one more selection here verse 17 and 18 now therefore O God listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy and for your own sake O Lord make your face to shine upon your sanctuary which is desolate. Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. Now, we're not under the old covenant, but that's a prayer that all of us could pray. We don't come to God based on our righteousness, but on his mercy. We don't ask for things and expect favor based on our righteousness but on his great mercy, his exceeding mercy. And God is merciful. Every day, the fact that people continue to live and exist on this earth is a testimony to God's mercy. His mercies are newly pronounced and experienced every morning. Verse 19, oh no, I said just up to verse 18, so we'll leave it. So the covenantal context is important. And that needs to be 
to be hovering there in our minds to help us understand the significance of the 70 weeks prophecy. God keeps covenant. Israel has broken covenant. The exile and the calamity that they've experienced is covenant judgment for their covenant breaking. And Daniel is asking God for mercy based on God's promise, which you can see in verse uh, verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books of the number of years, according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So it's approaching that time of restoration that God promised. Based on God's word, Daniel cries out for restoration. Verses 20 through 23, the angel Gabriel comes to deliver God's answer to the prayer. You know, I think we did a whole week on that little paragraph. I'm not sure, but if, we, if I looped that in with the other verses or if we did that paragraph by itself. But God sends Gabriel to give Daniel the answer to prayer. Verse 23, at the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out and I have come to tell it to you. So who did the word come out from? God. God is the one who orders angels. God is the one who tells angels what to do. The word went out. That's basically the angel saying the order went out. The order was given. And I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. So he's going to have a word and a vision that's going to answer his prayer and his cry for mercy. So it's really just going to give Daniel details about the restoration that God is going to bring. Um, you really see it vividly in the book of Revelation of God giving orders to angels. And then the angels just faithfully do, obediently do whatever God tells them to do. It's a good paradigm for us. It's a model for us. Of course, we'll never have perfect obedience until we uh, die and our souls go to heaven. But as children of God, we do obey God from a heart of love. Who gave us that heart of love? Did we, did we muster it up on our own strength and power? No, God, by his grace, caused us to be born again by the gospel. He gave us hearts that would love him by the spirit. And it's out of that heart of love that we obey God. We obey him truly, but not perfectly. And the, para the angelic paradigm for obedience is really, is really encouraging and it's a great reminder being saved by grace does not mean we go off and live however we please and not worry about obeying God. Being saved by grace means we've been transformed into a person who wants to obey God. That's salvation. So God gives Gabriel the word and the message and the charge to take to Daniel the answer to his prayer. That's the context. It's the context of a cry for restoration from covenantal judgment against Israel. Now the summary. Do you see that on there where it's bold and underlined? But I didn't I didn't put a uh, highlight feature on there or make it italics or all caps. There's more things I could have done to emphasize the summary. The summary of what Gabriel tells Daniel in the uh, in this answer to his prayer, is within 70 sevens or 70 weeks, both, both the provisional restoration and the ultimate restoration will come for Israel. Instead of ultimate, if you want to cross that out and put eschatological, you can. That just, mean, that just means the end time restoration, the final restoration. The provisional restoration would be the restoration of what? It would be the restoration of the physical nation of Israel, the southern kingdom to be exact, Judah. The southern kingdom would be returned to Judea and to Jerusalem, and the temple would be rebuilt, and the walls would be rebuilt, and temple worship would begin again. That would be the provisional restoration, the restoration of Israel as a nation, as a geopolitical entity on earth, a provisional restoration. 
But that is not the ultimate restoration that all of Scripture is leading up to and anticipating and promising and moving toward, advancing toward the ultimate restoration of complete redemption from sin, from the devil, and from death, from all the consequences of our sin. There is going to be an ultimate restoration, and that also comes out in prophecy. Now, you know the provisional restoration that Daniel is asking for specifically is going to be temporary. You learn that in this prophecy, that the sanctuary will be destroyed. Let's go through those bullet points, and I'll draw them out here, and then we'll look through on your handout, the bottom half of that page, the top of the page says Daniel 9, 24 through 27, God's faithfulness to his promise. The bottom half of that page, where you see the verse numbers, that is the New American Standard interpretation, which I think is a better and more easy to understand translation of this paragraph. You all know that I use the ESV, but um, there's, there's some things in this that's in, translated that's confusing in the ESV. So uh, the, the bullet points, it will take seven weeks for the provisional restoration after the word is decreed for them to return. And then another 62 weeks until the ultimate restoration. And then the last week is where the ultimate restoration is accomplished and the provisional restoration, which would be the temple, Jerusalem, old covenant worship, is done away with once for all. So, like I said, don't, let's not miss the forest for the trees. This overarching significance, historical significance, is really easy. It's real easy. There's going to be a provisional restoration of the nation, but it will be temporary. Now, we look back in history, and that's true. That happened. That, that happened. And then another 62 weeks until the ultimate restoration. That happened in the, coming, the first coming of Christ, inaugurated and accomplished the ultimate restoration from sin and death. And that last week... Uh, is where the ultimate restoration is accomplished and the provisional restoration is done away with once for all. Let me draw it and then we'll go through this new American standard interpretation. So there's going to be a decree that goes out. Um, Actually, we can do both at one time. We can draw and look. Verse 25, you are to know and understand that from the issuing of a decree, so that's the starting point, from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. We're not going to get into the dates and different views on that this week. We're going to save that kind of thing for either the next next session or the following. This is the starting point. If you remember back, this marks the end of the 70 years prophecy that was given to Jeremiah, that the people will be in Jerusalem. Babylonian exile for 70 years. And remember verse 2 in chapter 9, that's the basis of Daniel's prayer. So this decree will mark the fulfillment of that promise that the 70 years is coming to an end, but it is the beginning point of this promise. Now, overall, how many weeks? Overall, 70. He's giving us a time period of 77s or 70 weeks. We'll get into the different views on how how exactly in the details to understand that. We're just going to take it for what it says on the surface of it because the words right there in the scripture are the most important ones. And then there's various views of interpretation on this. But there's 77s. There should be an S here, right? Or 70 weeks. For the first seven, for the first seven, uh, verse 25 again, you are to know and understand that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there'll be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Seven weeks and 62 weeks. 
So seven weeks, this is all from verse 25. Seven weeks and then 62 weeks, which leaves how many weeks left? What, there's one week left. So remember now, unless we add something that's not here in the paragraph, which is all within 70 weeks. This is all within the 70 weeks. Whatever they are, it's all happening within the 70 weeks. There's going to be seven weeks plus 62 until Messiah. Verse 20. Uh, no, let's look at uh, the, uh, the substance that verse 25 provides. That's just the timing of it, the breakdown. So you are to know and understand that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with streets and moat, even in the time of distress or even in the times of trouble. So for this 62 weeks, for this 62 weeks, uh, the sanctuary, the city, will be built again. It'll have streets. The moat will be in full force again, even in times of distress or trouble, which if we, obviously we can't go back and review all of Daniel, but there's going to be times of persecution around here, around this time of kingdom transition from the from the, from the uh, Greek Empire to the Roman, and then from the Roman Empire, which is the time when God sets up his kingdom. So this is all still just one verse. So if you're getting lost, just keep reading verse 25. No one understand that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem um, until Messiah the Prince, there's going to be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It'll be built again with streets and moat. So, uh, again, we, in the coming weeks, we'll get into more of the detail. But apparently, this is the time of the rebuilding and restoring. When, when um, King Cyrus issues a decree that you can return to Jerusalem, you don't catch a flight the next day. This takes a lot of time. And to rebuild the temple, to clean up the streets. They don't have bulldozers. They don't have dumpsters. This is going to be. A, this is going to take a lot of time for the actual restoration of the people to the land and to the city, and to rebuild homes and the wall and roads and the temple. It's going to take time. So there's a time of restoration, and then there's a time of enjoying the fruit of that restoration. And that's the 62 weeks, where that is rebuilt there's your overall um, overall time frame of 70 weeks and then what's going to happen in the first 69 of those to the coming of the messiah now let's look at verse 26 through 27 then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. Which means he'll actually, he'll be the one to experience the desolations of God. The covenant judgment, the covenant anger and wrath of God. Now we, are, we all know where that happens. The cross of Jesus Christ. We cut off and have nothing and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. The things that are underlined, the things that are italics, the things that are in bold print. I'm just trying to bring your attention to different specific issues to be dealt with. And some that are you know, some of the debates. That's why. Uh, that's why I put those different ways of emphasizing some text. But look at what happens in connection historically. Zoom out and look at what happens in connection with the coming of the Messiah. 
um, to accomplish the work of redemption, the city and the sanctuary are destroyed. That's not something Daniel was expecting. What did he pray for? He prayed that the city and the sanctuary that were laying destroyed would be restored and rebuilt. And that is going to happen. That's the first part of it. Yeah, it'll be restored. It'll be rebuilt. And for 62 weeks, it will enjoy the restoration and the period of being rebuilt. rebuilt. But another destruction is coming, a final destruction. And, of course, you know why that's the case. For the old covenant to be established, for the new covenant to be established, the old covenant is done away with. Right? The old is done away with. The new is established in the blood of Christ. We are people under the new covenant. The old, to, to, the old covenant is not in effect any longer. And there is a final, this language is so clear and so strong in, toward the end of the gospel narratives that the final covenantal judgment on rebellious Israel is going to come. And the temple will be completely destroyed, and it was in the year 70. So that would have stood out to Daniel. It should stand out to us. He's praying for the restoration of these things. And the beginning of the prophecy is they will be restored. And then the Messiah will come. And he'll accomplish the final ultimate restoration. And then the city and sanctuary will be destroyed again. Verse 27. He will confirm a covenant with the many for one week. Now, I take that to be the, the grafting in of the Gentiles and the bringing of the gospel to the Gentiles. It's not just with the one nation, it's with the many. Um, but in the middle of the week, in the middle of the 70th week, he'll put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. That happened legally in the eyes of God, legally, literally, not symbolically, literally, when Christ once for all sacrificed himself on the cross. He put an end to all other sacrifices. No other sacrifice for sin or atonement or guilt or anything like that is acceptable to God any longer. That happened when Jesus Christ died on the cross. And it is blasphemy of the worst variety. If you were to go home or if I were to go home or go somewhere and offer something to God, a lamb, a goat, something, a bull, believing in our hearts that that could be the basis of God forgiving us or of God showing us favor. The sacrificial system is done away with. Put a stop to sacrifice and grain offerings. Why? Because Jesus on the cross made the made the offering of offerings all those other offerings under the old covenant all they did was serve as shadows and types that would foresignify the sacrifice of christ the blood of bulls and goats never took away the guilt of sins ever 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 but it was a visual a visualization a symbolic visualization of the work of christ this is all the book of Hebrews. I'm not quoting it, but this is, this is the theology of Hebrews, if you want to get it most clearly and straightforwardly. In the middle of the week, he'll put a stop to sacrifice. So the beginning of this week is the coming of the Messiah, specifically is the anointing of him, which I take to be his baptism, where he was anointed with the power of the Holy Spirit. In the middle of that week is the cross, where he puts an end to sacrifice and grain offering, and upon the wing of abominations will come the one who makes desolate until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, gushes forth on the one who makes desolate. Now the pattern there is very similar to the pattern that you see in the Old Testament for, um, let's just use Babel, the Babylonian Empire as an example, since we're in Daniel. God uses a nation... And he uses a secular leader as his vehicle of judgment against his people. But then afterwards, he'll bring judgment against that nation and that secular leader for their sin and for their rebellion. Because in their heart, even though God and his sovereignty was using them as a vehicle of, of uh, ju uh, judgment, in their hearts, they weren't serving God. 
They weren't loving God. So same pattern here. There's going to be one who makes desolate. There's going to be an earthly nation, an earthly wicked king that God will use to bring judgment and destruction upon Israel for their, really their climactic covenant rebellion, which is rejecting and crucifying Christ. But then he's also going to bring judgment on the, on the one who makes desolate. So, got all that? <laughs> Ready for the quiz. Ready for the quiz. And when, you, when, we, when we zoom out and look at the overall picture of transition from Old Covenant to New Covenant, right? that's easy to see. When we zoom out and see the overarching picture that God is going to bring judgment against Israel for their covenant rebellion, that's easy to see. And when we zoom out and see the overarching picture of Christ coming, Messiah means Christ, Christ coming to accomplish redemption, it, that's easy to see. So the overarching things are easy to see. And they're the most important things to see. Seventy weeks. However you interpret that, it's not going to be 69, 69 and a half. It's not going to be 70 and a half, 71, 73. It's going to happen within 70 weeks, 70 sevens. All right. I'm not taking questions tonight. I, just like last time, Vince will be available for questions <laughs> afterwards. I always have questions about this stuff. Always, no matter how many times, you know, it's not, this isn't something that, a paragraph of scripture that you nail down and, and nail down perfectly and move on. Like we're always growing and always learning. And then passages that are hotly debated so much. These are also passages where we have a peculiar opportunity to grow in grace and charity toward those who disagree with us and to learn how to listen well. And don't assume that um, just because someone's saying something you haven't heard before, don't assume that it's wrong. This is where God can really humble us and teach us and teach us to be teachable, which is one of the hardest things to learn. In Proverbs, it's one of the, one of the defining traits of wisdom is being teachable, being able to learn. Just because I haven't heard uh, a specific take on something doesn't mean that that take is wrong. I don't know everything. Um, so context is covenantal. There's, Daniel prayed for restoration because Israel has experienced calamity and exile and destruction for their covenant breaking. Uh, the summary is within 70 weeks, there's going to be both the provisional, both, both the provisional and the ultimate restoration for Israel. And then, you know, the ultimate restoration doesn't include just Israel. It's first to Israel and then to whom? <laughs> Vince is going like this. Yeah, everybody. Savior, savior of the world. Yes, yeah, someone was listening to my last sermon. He's the savior of the world. He's the light of the world. Abraham was promised a nation and that from within that nation would come the Redeemer. So provisional restoration, ultimate restoration, but then on the wing of that, on the tail end of that, uh, would be the destruction of what had been provisionally restored. The doing away. It's more than just the doing away of the Old Covenant. It's the doing away of the Old Covenant and bringing final um, covenantal judgment upon rebellious Israel. And it's so important that I say upon rebellious Israel because there's more to Israel than just rebellious Israel. There's what's called the faithful remnant, the faithful remnant within Israel. There, has al there had always been true believers within Israel. And it's those true believers, um, if the coming of Christ, that are the foundation of the church. The foundation stone is Christ. And then True Israel, spiritual Israel, children of God within Israel. And then Gentiles are grafted into that. So we, so we have to modify and give some nuance. So when we talk about God's covenant judgment and destruction of the temple, it's on lost people 
who were really, truly under a covenant of works and broke that covenant in their hearts, minds, lips, wills, actions, worship, idolatries, whatever. Um, let's go to the next handout. I thought I had a cup of water right here. Where I look like I'm losing my mind up here. I don't. Um, overview, the covenantal context or significance, we've already talked about that. Uh, the, I want us to transition to thinking about the meaning of the time designation. The meaning of the time designation. We're not going to talk about specific dates tonight. Not because that's irrelevant. That's not irrelevant. You know, we will talk about dates. We will talk about different ways that people map out the dates. But the 70 weeks have a theological significance. That number has meaning. 77s has meaning. A time frame in Scripture can be given, and they, they often are given, a theological significance. In literal history, it can be an approximation. It doesn't need to be to the hour, to the day, to the week, even to the year. It could be an approximation. Um, the way God uses numbers is not subject to the way that modern man uses numbers in, with scientific precision, precision and mechanical precision. But the number has a theological or a covenantal significance. So the provisional restoration would come after 70 years, which is 10 Sabbaths. That's from Jeremiah 25, 11 through 12. That was written about in the law of Moses, in Leviticus. Turn to Leviticus 27 with me. Leviticus 27, and I probably overshot and took passages that were far too large to be able to get through all of this, but that's why this is what I was thinking of when I said earlier, I want to go slow. I don't want to just rush through them. I want us to get our eyes on this word. This was the covenant document that the people of God lived under its authority and were accountable to. Leviticus 26 Yeah, so in 26, in the context, it's punishments for disobedience. And um, we're at verse 27. So in the context of threatenings for disobedience, this is what the law contains, generally speaking. It, it contains um, uh, rewards and blessings based on obedience that are promised based on obedience, but it threatens punishment and judgment based on disobedience. Aren't you happy we're not under the law, but under grace? The law has the law of God, which is holy and good and pure and perfect, but it doesn't have the authority to threaten us with condemnation if we're in Christ. And it doesn't have the authority to promise us a blessing based on our obedience. We're not under the, the, the covenant authority of the law. We're under grace. Um, where blessing precedes obedience. Life is not the reward that comes at the end of obedience. Life is the gift that comes and leads to obedience. That's the gospel pattern. All right, Leviticus 26, 27 through 35. But if in spite of this you will not listen to me but walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you in fury, and I myself will discipline you sevenfold for your sins. You see that sevenfold um, covenant wrath coming in uh, Revelation 2, that pattern of seven seals on the scroll, then seven trumpets of judgment, and then seven bowls of wrath, sevenfold judgment, judgment of judgments. You shall eat the flesh of your sons, and you shall eat the flesh of your daughters, and I will destroy your high places and cut down your incense altars and cast your dead bodies upon the dead bodies of your idols. 
and my soul will abhor you. What does abhor mean? To hate intensely. To, to, to despise, yeah. Abhor, yeah, yeah. There's this idea of, uh, of, of gross, grossness, the, the grotesque nature of what's being despised. And I will lay your cities waste. I will make your sanctuaries desolate. And I will not smell your pleasing aromas. That's going to put an end to sacrifice. And I myself will devastate the land so that your enemies will settle in it. Your enemies who settle in it shall be appalled at it. And I will scatter you among the nations. And I will unsheathe the sword after you. And your land shall be a desolation. And your cities shall be a waste. So what's the over? overarching picture here of what's being threatened of for the disobedience and idolatry is coming destruction and desolation the wrath of god is coming verse 34 what you have to picture here is the people being driven from the land and the land now being left desolate of uh, of uh, covenant worship of the life of, under the covenant it's desolate then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate. There's your thing to circle or underline or highlight or just put it in your memory bank. As the land is desolate, under God's judgment, the land is enjoying rest. It's plural, Sabbaths. It's enjoying its Sabbath rest. While you are in your enemy's land, then the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. As long as it lies desolate, it shall have rest. The rest it did not have on your Sabbaths when you were dwelling in it. So they did not enjoy the proper rest and the proper observation of the Sabbath, which is a, a centerpiece covenant sign and part of. You know, the weekly center of covenant life for them, the day of rest, Sabbath. So now here the land in a symbolic ode to their disobedience, the land will experience rest. The, experience, the land experiences Sabbaths. Then scan down to verse 40. But if they confess their iniquity... And the iniquity of their fathers in their treachery that they committed against me um, and also in walking contrary to me. Now, when I read that verse, I can't help but think of Daniel's prayer. That's exactly what Daniel does on behalf of the people. Confess their iniquity and confess the iniquity of their fathers. Verse 41, so that I walked contrary to them and brought them into the land of their enemies if then their uncircumcised heart is humbled and they make amends for their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and I will remember my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham and I will remember the land. But the land shall be abandoned by them and enjoy its Sabbaths while it lies desolate without them. You see the the land is desolate because the people have been exiled from the land because of God's judgment. What's the theological symbolism or significance of the land? It's enjoying rest. It's enjoying Sabbaths. The land shall be abandoned by them and enjoy its Sabbaths while it lies desolate without them. And they shall make amends for their iniquity because they spurned my rules and their soul abhorred my statutes. Yet for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not spurn them, neither will I abhor them, so as to destroy them utterly and break my covenant with them. Think back again to Daniel's prayer. It's God who keeps covenant. For I am the Lord their God, but I will, for their sake, remember the covenant with their forefathers, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. People will be restored after the land enjoys its Sabbath rest. This is the covenantal. Hopefully you saw that word over and over again in this passage. The covenant, covenant, covenant. 
There's a covenantal significance of the time designation. Another example of theological time frame is uh, Israel wandering in the wilderness. It'll be for 40 years. If you go to Numbers 14, 32 and following, you'll see that this is um, to represent and to symbolize the 40 days of the spying out of the land. So that that, so that that very time frame that they're in the wilderness would be a, a testimony, an object lesson to that next generation to help them remember, to trust in God, to walk by faith, not by sight, not fear of the enemy, but trust in the promises of God. So the 40 days of scouting and spying out the promised land caused them, the people overall, not Joshua and Caleb, but caused Ten of the spies and caused the people as a whole um, to doubt God's promise that he would give them the land. It was supposed to solidify that promise in their hearts. It wasn't supposed to break them doubt God's promise. And then, of course, that, that number 40 will become significant. It comes to represent a time of trial or a time of preparation. What's another time where 40 is used in, as a theological significance of in the scripture, Jesus, 40 days in the wilderness, this time of trial, this time of temptation, preparing him for his public ministry. So there's a theological significance, or you could say a spiritual significance. Sometimes when you say spiritual significance, people think you mean metaphorical. I don't, for me, spiritual doesn't mean metaphorical, because for me, spiritual things are real things. Spiritual things are literal. If spiritual things are not real, if spiritual things are not literal, we're in trouble. So, but it is a spiritual significance. But the most specific, I think the best, the most specific biblical term, because it's specific in terms of the, what's actually going on is it's covenantal. It's a covenantal meaning. So that's the provisional restoration that was part of legislation. In the Mosaic Covenant, this is a specific covenant uh, threatening for disobedience. That upon disobedience, the people would be exiled, the land would lay desolate, so that the land would experience its Sabbaths. So, Jeremiah is told by God in Jeremiah 25, it's going to be 70 years. 70 years where the people are in exile. 70 years where the land is desolate. What's the significance? Well, that's 10 Sabbaths. That's 10 Sabbaths. It'll be rest, time of rest for the land, and then the people could be restored. And we'll get to the significance of 10 down below. Um, just hold it in your back pocket. But that's 10 Sabbaths. Now, that's a, theolo that's a covenantal significance to uh, the time frame of a, of a Sabbath would be seven years and then the sabbath year seventh day is the sabbath day seventh year is the sabbath year ultimate restoration ultimate restoration brings us to this ultimate restoration brings us to this the provisional restoration that is promised to jeremiah will come after 70 years the ultimate restoration will come after 77 77 which would be 70 sabbaths 70 sabbaths you like all these numbers Seventy Sabbaths, but it's even more significant um, here after because because there's something very, very special that happens in the Bible um, after seven Sabbaths or what's that would be 49 years. It's the year of Jubilee. All right, so now this is going to be the. I've been using the phrase ultimate restoration, the biblical, um, the biblical word, one of the biblical words would be jubilee, jubilee, the year of jubilee, which would come after 49 years or seven sevens, uh, represented liberty for the captives. And now in the situation of Israel being restored, who's the captives? Israel's the captives. The year of Jubilee represented liberty for the captives, and it represented the celebration of God's redemption. 
Another way to call, the, call this is the, Lord, the year of the Lord's favor. The year of Jubilee would be the year of the Lord's favor, his gracious favor, the favor of God manifest in redemption. Um, we have time for this. This is only a few verses. Leviticus 25, 8 to 12. This also is in the law. Leviticus 25. 8 through 12. This is just a portion of the passage on the year of Jubilee. All right. You're going to see very familiar language here that we've been talking about in Daniel. You shall count seven weeks of years. Seven times seven years. So don't blame me for the, all this use of numbers and multiplication and all that. This is just the way God did things. You shall count seven weeks of years. Seven times seven years. So that the time of the seven weeks of years shall give you 49 years. Be repetitive, Moses. We're not getting the point. Then you shall sound the loud trumpet on the 10th day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement. So this is the day of atonement at the end of seven weeks of years. On the day of atonement. You shall sound the trumpet throughout all your land, and you shall consecrate the 50th year. So the 50th year is consecrated. It's set apart to be unique, separate and apart from years 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, all the way up through 49. The 50th year is to be consecrated and set apart and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants, it shall be a jubilee for you when each of you shall return to his property and each of you shall return to his clan. The 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. In it you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of itself nor gather the grapes from the undressed vines for it's a jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You may eat the produce of the fields. You have a Sabbath day every week, a Sabbath year every seven years, and then at the end of seven Sabbath cycles, seven 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 weeks, have a year of jubilee, the year of ultimate rest, the year of uh, supreme rest, to enjoy the Lord's favor in a unique way. Now, uh, The last few bullet points. Back to the number 10. Back to the number 10. The number 10 represents completion. Um, it pertains to the full number of something that God purposes or wills. So completion in general, there are other numbers that symbolize completion or maturity or perfection. And they all have different nuance and are used in slightly different ways. Although there's, a, there's an overlap. It's not a... Uh, precise science but most of the time 10 represents the full number of something that god purposes or wills and after 10 that's it <laughs> the 10th is the final one 10th represents the completion of god bringing something that he purposed or planned to his completion as he decreed it think of the 10 commandments the 10 plagues often in prophecy you'll see 10 horns represented that this this, uh, this beast may have a lot of authority, but it's exactly the amount of authority that God has decreed and determined. It's not outside God's sovereign control. 10% to give. Uh, the 10th day of the first month for sacrificing the Passover lamb. The 10th day of the 7th month for the Day of Atonement, which also launched the year of Jubilee officially when that came. Now, here's your two, the three bullet points that are indented the most what i've tried to do in three bullet points here is to bring this all together and how it relates to this how it relates to this how it relates to the 77s really basically the 77s brings you to the the uh, eschatological jubilee the ultimate jubilee the ultimate year of the lord's favor so if 49 we're going to have to do some math here 
49, or seven Sabbaths, leads into Jubilee. That's what we just read in Leviticus 25. 49 leads into Jubilee. Then 490 leads into the ultimate Jubilee that God has purposed. Seven, seven Sabbaths times 10, which is 77. Seven Sabbaths times 10. Now, you already know what the ultimate ju- jubilee is. It's the rest and redemption accomplished by Christ. And you see that language in different ways all throughout the 70 weeks prophecy. The rest and re- redemption accomplished by Christ. 77s leads to ultimate restoration. It's 10 times 7 Sabbaths. And I'll prove it to you. Luke, Turn to Luke 4. This will be our last one. Luke 4, 16. The year of Jubilee is called the the time of the Lord's favor or the year of the Lord's favor in Isaiah. Paul quotes it as such in 2 Corinthians. But Jesus launches his ministry. Luke 4, 16. By declaring that in him has come the year of the Lord's favor. In his coming is the coming of the ultimate jubilee, covenantal rest for the people of God. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me, the anointing of the Messiah. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim proclaim liberty to the captives, Jubilee, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's the year of Jubilee, the year of God's gracious favor and rest. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him, marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And um, what's going to happen in just this paragraph, you can read it tonight um, in your devotions. He speaks about uh, this favor and grace coming to Gentiles as well. And then they want to kill him. So they're marveling at him, listening attentively to him. Is that even a word, attentively? Um, Intently, that's what I was thinking of. They're being attentive and listening intently. And But once he continues to teach about the Gentiles being brought in, they want to kill him. uh, Verse 28, they were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill in which the town was built so they could throw him off a cliff. But he starts with the scripture, the prophecy from Isaiah, the year of the Lord's favor, the, uh, the year of final redemption, full and final redemption. And in him it was fulfilled. His first coming doesn't postpone the fulfillment. His first coming is the fulfillment to inaugurate these things and they'll be consummated when he returns let's pray